uh, six o'clock Central European time. And given that we have only one hour, I think uh, we we should start our next session. It's a, a great pleasure for me to chair this distinguished panel, which concludes the 12th edition of the International Research Forum on Monetary Policy. This conference was first held in 2002 with the intention to uh, establish a transatlantic dialogue on monetary policy in the euro area and the United States. It uh, brings together central bankers and academics, which is mirrored in the organizing institutions. The Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System and the ECB, together with the Euro Area Business Cycle Network. It is equally mirrored in our selection of participants for this panel, all of which not only have broad experience in central banking, but also in academia. It has been a good tradition to not only discuss new research at this conference, but to also host a policy panel where current issues in monetary policy making are discussed. And some of these topics have changed over the past 20 years, but actually quite a few have remained on the agenda. Let me give you a few examples. So, for example, in, in 2012, the policy panel discussed monetary and fiscal policy interactions in an era of high debt, which continues to be debated intensively. In 2018, the discussion focused on the causes and consequences of the waning support for globalization, a topic that has gained importance due to the pandemic and sadly to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Today's panel is on monetary policy during and after the pandemic. And this broad topic will allow us to discuss the various monetary policy challenges that we are currently facing. Clearly, the most pressing issue uh, today is to understand the extraordinarily high levels of inflation in the euro area, the US and globally, which none of us had seen coming. So how persistent are these inflationary pressures? How do they interact with inflation expectations? And how should monetary policy react at a time when global growth is moderating due to the war in Ukraine and lockdowns in China? One question that may be of particular interest is the distinction between the euro area and the United States. Uh, in a recent speech, I have questioned the view that inflation dynamics on both sides of the Atlantic are fundamentally different. And I'm, of course, curious to hear your views on this. We may also want to discuss the specific challenges for emerging market uh, economies. What is clear is that we have entered a process of global policy normalization after a long period of highly expansionary monetary policy in many parts of the world. And this process uh, gives rise to new questions. So how quickly should monetary policy be normalized? What is the neutral rate and will central banks have to raise rates beyond that rate? Where is monetary policy heading regarding balance sheets? And what are the risks and benefits of this normalization, for example, for banks profitability or financial stability? And finally, taking a longer term perspective, what will the economy look like after the pandemic and the tragic events in Ukraine? Will structural shifts like deglobalization and the green transition put persistent upward pressure on inflation? So will we enter a new regime with too high rather than too low inflation? So we will start this panel with a round of introductory remarks from our three excellent panelists to kick off our discussion. Uh, each of you will have 10 minutes and then we will first uh, briefly discuss among ourselves before opening the floor to the audience. If you um, were a speaker or discussant at this conference, you can simply raise your virtual hand and then you can ask your questions directly. All others are kindly asked to enter your questions in the chat with all participants and I will then read them to the panel. So let me introduce our first speaker. Loretta Mester is president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland and currently a member of the Federal Open Market Committee. 
She's also an adjunct professor of finance at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. She's known as an excellent economist and also as a great communicator of Fed policies. As regards current Fed policy, she recently said in an interview that she doesn't want to rule anything out. And of course, we are curious to hear what that could mean. So the floor is yours, Loretta, please. Oh, thank you very much, Isabel. And thank you um, to the International Research Forum on Monetary Policy. I'm really excited to be part of the panel and uh, participate in the discussion. Of course, the FOMC, Federal Open Market Committee, met last week. So I thought what I'd do in my remarks is just review the FOMC's recent decisions and put them into context. And of course, what I say today are my own views and not those of the Federal Reserve System or my colleagues on the FOMC. So, you know, it's important to start with uh, just the simple fact that in making monetary policy decisions, the FOMC is always guide, guided by a strong commitment to achieving its goals of price stability and maximum employment. And at the start of the pandemic in March 2020, the FOMC reduced the target range of its policy rate, which is the Fed funds rate, to zero to a quarter percent um, to support the economy in the wake of the COVID shock, which was unprecedented. The FOMC also used its balance sheet as a policy tool. We bought large quantities of treasury securities and agency mortgage-backed securities um, first to reduce the severe strains in financial markets seen early in the pandemic and then to support the economy. Now, in March of this year, the FOMC raised its policy rate by 25 basis points. And last week, it raised the Fed funds rate by another 50 basis points and indicated that it believes ongoing rate increases will be appropriate. And then the committee also announced that uh, we'll begin reducing our balance sheet assets starting in June. So, these actions are what I've called the great recalibration of US monetary policy. It's a shift from the extraordinarily accommodative policy needed earlier in the pandemic to a policy stance that's really appropriate for addressing the key challenge facing the US economy. And then, as Isabel said in other countries as well, unacceptably high inflation. Now, while liftoff of the funds rate from zero only occurred in March, this recalibration actually began in the autumn of last year. So if you look back last September, the FOMC indicated it would soon be time to taper asset purchases. And then it announced that the beginning of tapering uh, would be in November. Then in December, the FOMC sped up the tapering and released projections indicating that participants now expected an earlier liftoff of the policy rate, rate than they had previously anticipated. In January, the FOMC indicated it would soon be time to raise the policy rate, and then it followed through with the first increase in March. And then asset purchases also ended in early March. So this recalibration of policy has really reflected the evolution of economic conditions, the economic outlook, and importantly, the risks around the outlook. Now, if you think through um, you know, the challenges that have been posed by the pandemic, it is quite remarkable that U.S. economic growth was very strong last year. Real GDP grew at a 5.5% rate, which was the highest annual pace since 1984, well above trend growth, which my estimate of trend growth is about 2%. The decline in real GDP in the first quarter, if you look at the data, the details of the report, it was driven mainly by declines in net exports, government spending, and a still high but lower level of inventory investment compared to the fourth quarter last year. So growth in consumer spending and business fixed investment remained solid last quarter, and there continues to be positive underlying momentum and demand. Household and business balance sheets are still very healthy, um, reflecting high savings accumulated during the pandemic. Now, that strong demand has occurred in the face of very constrained supply in both product and labor markets. In product markets, differences in virus conditions and virus containment policies have resulted in really a cascade of disruptions to the global supply chain. China's zero COVID policy has further disrupted supply chains, and Russia's dastardly invasion of Ukraine has further constrained supplies in energy, metals, and agricultural commodity markets. In addition, labor markets remain really tight. Uh, the U.S. economy added 6.7 million jobs last year, 
And despite widespread reports from firms about how hard it is to find workers, monthly payroll gains have averaged above 500,000 over the first four months of this year. The unemployment rate has also fallen. It's now at 3.6%, which is nearly as low as its lowest reading during the pre-pandemic expansion. And that's when everyone knew that labor markets were quite strong. Labor force participation is still below its pre-pandemic level in the United States, but it's improved significantly over time. Still, labor supply has not been able to keep up with very robust demand for labor. If you look at job openings, they're at extremely high levels by historical standards. There's almost two openings for every unemployed worker. Um, and in 2019, again, when the labor market was strong, that ratio was 1.2 openings per unemployed worker. So with demand out of balance with supply in both product markets and in labor markets, prices and wages have moved up. Um, and over time, those price pressures have broadened across goods and services. And inflation readings in the US are now at the highest level they've been in 40 years. If you look at the data measured year over year in March, total PC inflation was over 6.5%. Core PC inflation was nearly 5.25%. And one of the measures that the Cleveland Fed produces, median PCE inflation was almost four and a quarter percent. Wage pressures are also continuing to build. The unemployment cost index for private industry workers accelerated over the three months ending in March, rising at 5.8 percent um, at an annual pace. So higher wages that reflect higher productivity growth are a positive for the economy. And a higher level of wages represents a shift of income share from capital to labor. But the current pace of wage increases is inconsistent with maintaining price stability. So the Fed is really committed to using its tools to get inflation under control by bringing excess demand into better balance with constrained supply. And, you know, it's likely going to take some time for inflation to reach our long run goal of 2% because several of the factors that have contributed to the very high inflation readings are supply side factors, which monetary policy can affect, and because inflation tends to be persistent. But as we recalibrate our policy, I'm going to be looking for compelling evidence that inflation is on a downward trajectory toward our 2% goal. And I think we're going to be able to gauge improvement by looking at the monthly changes in inflation readings to see if inflation is indeed beginning to move down. Now, the monthly increases in the core PC and price index in March was little change from its February reading, and the monthly reading of the Cleveland Fed's median PC, PC inflation uh, moved down in March. So those were positive signs, but the more recent April data on the CPI, um, that was not positive. The monthly CPI inflation rate increased, and of course, the risk to inflation remained strongly on the upside, especially in the midst of the continuing war in Ukraine and the potential that the zero COVID policy in China will further disrupt the supply chain. So I'm going to need to see several months of sustained downward monthly readings of inflation before I will conclude that inflation has peaked. Now, a risk management perspective, I think, argues for that caution because, first, inflation risks are to the upside. And second, because the longer inflation runs above our goal, the higher the risk that long-term inflation expectations become unanchored, thereby making the return to price stability much more costly. And we already see that medium and longer-term inflation expectations have moved up. If you look at the board staff's measure of common inflation expectations, which is a nice measure in that it summarizes a number of other measures, um, that's been rising, and it's at the upper range um, of value seen since 2005. So, of course, some of that rise um, has been driven um, by increases in near-term expectations, which are driven by the high inflation readings we're seeing. But I really don't think it's prudent to ignore the rise in longer and medium-term inflation expectations, given the serious harm that would be caused were long-term expectations to move above levels consistent with our long-run goal of 2% um, inflation. So in my view, the FOMC is going to need to be resolute um, and intentional in removing policy accommodation at the pace needed to get inflation under control. Um, and you know, if you think about inflation, this high inflation is really imposing 
a real burden on households and businesses, especially those that don't have the wherewithal to pay more for essential goods and services. So if we were to fail to do what's necessary to get inflation down, we would be jeopardizing sustaining healthy labor markets over the medium and longer run, again, hurting lower income households. So I don't really see the current situation as one involving a trade-off between the Fed's two goals. Now, the current target range of the funds rate is 75 to 100 basis points. That's well below the range of estimates of the longer run neutral nominal policy rate, which neither stimulates nor restrains economic activity. For example, if you look at the March summary of economic projections of FOMC participants, the range of estimates of the longer run funds rate is 2 to 3 percent. And of course, the real funds rate is still negative. So given economic conditions, ongoing increases in the federal funds rate are called for. And unless there are some big surprises, I expect it will be appropriate to raise the policy rate another 50 basis points at each of our next two meetings. Now, what comes next? Well, at that point, the nominal funds rate will be nearing the lower end of estimates of the neutral rate and balance sheet reductions will be underway. And then the FOMC, I think, will be well positioned to consider the appropriate pace at which to continue removing accommodation over the balance of the year and how far above neutral rates will need to go. Now, it's going to be challenging to remove accommodation at the pace needed to get inflation under control while sustaining healthy, healthy labor market conditions. Um, there are likely to be bumps in the road. Um, growth could slow a bit more than expected for a couple of quarters, and the unemployment rate, unemployment rate could move up temporarily. Nonetheless, the FOMC will be aiming to calibrate our policy to bring be demand better in line with supply, thereby putting inflation on a downward trajectory towards 2%. And that calibration is going to entail assessing the various forces that are going to be affecting the demand and supply sides of the economy. So as I mentioned, ongoing war in Ukraine and the COVID lockdowns in China pose upside risks to inflation, but also some downside risks to growth. Broader financial conditions have already tightened considerably um, as markets have anticipated further rate increases in light of the Fed's forward guidance. For example, if you look at the 30-year mortgage rate in the United States, uh, it was under 3% last September. It's now 5.25%. And the Fed's balance sheet reduction will soon be underway. So those tighter financial conditions are going to help moderate excess demand. With some luck, supply chain disruptions will begin to abate and labor market participation will continue to rise. And that'll help ease supply constraints, um, allowing supply and product and labor markets to come in better balance with demand. But we can't rely on luck. With both supply and demand adjusting over time, I'm going to monitor economic and financial developments closely to gauge that balance between demand and supply and use that to determine appropriate monetary policy. So if by the September FOMC meeting, the monthly readings on inflation provide compelling evidence that inflation is moving down towards our goal, then the pace of rate increases could slow. But if inflation has failed to moderate, then a faster pace of rate increases may be necessary. Now, as I, as I mentioned, in addition to raising our policy rate, we're initiating that balance sheet reductions um, starting in June. And that's going to be done primarily by adjusting the reinvestment amounts of the principal payments the Fed receives on its assets. So starting in June, the Fed is going to allow up to $30 billion per month of Treasury securities and up to $17.5 billion of agency securities to run off the balance sheet. And then after three months, those caps will rise to $60 billion per month for Treasuries and $35 billion per month for agency securities. So, And then to the extent that maturing Treasury coupon securities are less than the monthly cap, Treasury bills are going to make up the rest of the runoff up to the cap. So the plan that the FOMC announced last week did not rule out asset sales. Um, and I personally would favor the FOMC considering asset sales after balance sheet reduction is well underway to speed up the return of the portfolio's composition to being primary treasury securities. I think that's very consistent with the FOMC's stated desire to minimize the effect of the Fed's balance sheet holdings on the allocation of credit across economic sectors. The plan also didn't indicate what size the balance sheet will be when the Fed ends the reductions, but it gave some guidance. So we're going to be implementing, we are implementing policy by 
um, an ample reserves operating regime in which reserve levels are ample enough that control over the federal funds rate and other short-term interest rates is ex executed primarily through setting the Fed's administered rates and where active management of the supply of, the re of reserves isn't needed. So what we're intending to do is to slow and then stop the reduction in balance sheet assets when reserve balances are somewhat above the level we judge consistent with ample reserves. And then once runoff is stopped, reserve balances will likely continue to fall for a time, reflecting growth in the Fed's uh, other liabilities until the FOMC judges that we've reached that ample reserve level. And at that point, the FOMC will then manage its security holdings to maintain ample reserves over time. So we don't put a number on it yet. The ample reserve level is uncertain. It's going to depend on the banking sector's demand for reserves as well as the distribution of that demand across the institution, and that's going to evolve over time. So as the process to reduce the size of the balance sheet progresses, we're going to be monitoring developments in money markets to determine the appropriate level of reserves in which to end balance sheet runoff, consistent with maintaining that ample reserve balance um, over time. So that concludes my remarks about the great recalibration of U.S. monetary policy, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the other panelists and to participating into the discussion. Thanks. Thank you uh, so much, Loretta. This this was a fantastic overview of everything that's happening at the Fed and uh, your uh, personal thinking about this. Uh, this was uh, extremely interesting. So now we're going to, to move on to our uh, second speaker, who is Lucrezia uh, Reichlin, who is Professor of Economics at the London Business School. She is, uh, in my view, one of the most creative and entrepreneurial researchers. And so it is not surprising that she was a co-founder of the Euro Area Business Cycle Network. In her capacity as Director General for Research at the ECB from 2005 uh, till 2008, she was actually one of the co-organizers of this conference. And she recently wrote a very interesting Vox EU column on the two-dimensional feature of ECB monetary policy. And uh, my guess will be that she's going to tell us a bit uh, about this now. So we're looking forward to your remarks, Lucrezia. Thank you, Isabel, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so let me just start a little bit from afar and, uh, you know, in a fateful uh, uh, correlation with the title of our panel. Um, I mean, my first remark is that uh, really the last 15 years for central bankers, uh, for central banking have been uh, indeed very exciting. And uh, we now have, a, you know, many uh, new operational tools uh, uh, and central banks have acquired a larger role in financial markets uh, as liquidity providers and market makers uh, beyond the narrow function of monetary policy. Now, uh, the strict separation between monetary policy, financial stability, fiscal policy has, uh, as a consequence, been blurred. And uh, the discussion on how to handle those connections uh, and trade-offs, uh, it's open and ongoing, particularly at this juncture. Now, today, with the um, wakening of up of inflation, the older discussion on how to handle trade-offs between inflation and the output gap is also coming alive, but in a new context uh, where, as I said, central banks have many instruments and uh, also, however, have built uh, a reputational capital as inflation targeters, which is a very different context uh, than in the 70s. So in my remarks, uh, I will focus on the ECB and the euro area and talk about uh, two topics. The ECB during the pandemic, uh, I will just uh, describe a few salient uh, uh, issues there. And then uh, on the second topic, uh, I will, you know, uh, address the issues of the challenge that the, the ECB is facing today and how the lessons learned in the pandemic can be exploited in these new circumstances. So let me start from the first topic, the pandemic. Um, I think that the, Basically, there were two lessons. I don't know if uh, Isabel is in agreement with me. Well, the first of all is that, uh, first of all, that coordination between monetary and fiscal policy uh, worked, and that was a very important element for stabilization in the euro area. 
Uh, this is not at all an obvious remark for, for, for us Europeans. I mean, it, it may sound a little bit strange in the, in the other side of the Atlantic, but for us, this has been a very hot topic. And the second lesson is that the balance sheet policies implemented in a flexible way uh, are very powerful in a double role. The first role is uh, compressing interest rate spreads in various markets, and this is the goal is mostly one of financial stability. But also they've been uh, um, successful in achieving the monetary policy objective in a traditional uh, monetary policy, um, you know, justification for those policies. Now, on monetary policy, uh, on monetary and fiscal coordination, uh, uh, my view is that the ECB action was important to support the aggressive fiscal policy, uh, which took place at the national level. But also the new instruments at the federal level, and here I'm referring uh, especially to the NGU, the new generation uh, EU program, was pivotal, pivotal together with, uh, with uh, the pandemic program that the ECB uh, put in place for the stability in sovereign markets. And uh, unlike in 2009, uh, uh, both policy move in the same direction and reinforce each other. Now, on the balance sheet pro uh, policy, and here I'm referring uh, um, to the PEP program, uh, which was the COVID-related uh, um, asset purchase program that the ACB implemented in March 2020. Um, I think that, that how did that program work uh, is just an illustration uh, of, this, of the double role of balance sheet policies. On one hand, uh, providing liquidity to the market in times of financial stress, um, you know, COVID was such an example of financial stress. You know, these are periods in which the old financial system may want to shift into safe liquidity, liquid reserves, and uh, the lack of market liquidity uh, when everyone is trying to sell asset may lead to fire sale of asset and may trigger financial crisis. So by providing liquidity, the central bank can improve or even avoid such panics. Um, so in that way, the central banks uh, act as a market maker by, by doing so, or, you know, increase the liquidity of assets uh, and also achieve a compression of spreads in several pockets of the market. Now, the second role is the one of affecting the long term, um, the long side of the yield curve uh, and, uh, you know, by, uh, by sovereign purchases and long, uh, long uh, data security. Uh, here, the role of the central bank is quite different. The central banks become a market participant, so an investor with an inelastic demand. As such, it absorbs risk from the market, swaps safe reserves for risky debt securities, and also that, uh, you know, to achieve a compression uh, of interest rate spreads, which reduces borrowing costs uh, and for firms, for companies, and also for uh, governments. So this mechanism uh, is uh, likely to be particularly relevant uh, when uh, um, those when the governments are under spending constraints or, ma or market pressures. Now, as I said, so these are the two the two mechanisms, and I think in PEP we had both. And uh, um, and one uh, characteristics of PEP, uh, as opposed to us to the APP to the APP program, was its flexibility. And uh, here I come so, to the core of my argument. Uh, so um, this flexibility of uh, um, buying uh, sovereign uh, debt uh, in proportions, which are different from the capital key, are very important if one considers that uh, in the euro area, there is a double dimension of monetary policies. We are in a monetary union. We do not have uh, an area-wide an area common safe asset. Uh, and uh, as it has been documented by many papers and many observers, uh, whenever there is stress, uh, what you observe is a flight to safety, uh, which has a, a geographical dimension. So in periods of risk uh, aversion, uh, the flight to safety takes the form of the flight to safer jurisdictions, uh, and uh, uh, this leads to geographical reallocation. So in this in, in this situation, uh, we have learned, uh, you know, with you know, with, with the experience of several crises, that, that the central banks needs to intervene to avoid uh, uh, and to stop a potential self-fulfilling dynamics, uh, which is not justified by fundamentals. 
So this is, a, a, this is one dimension, okay? And, and this is a, essentially a problem of financial stability, but not only, it is also a problem of monetary policy because the sovereign uh, yields uh, are very important in the transmission of monetary policy uh, in the Euro area, because they are the basis uh, for the setting of uh, other interest rate, uh, which uh, then determine the funding cost uh, for corporates, for banks, uh, and so on. So, as a consequence, the, the ECB has to monitor not only the risk-free curve, but also has to keep an eye on the spread across rates of different countries. This, of course, is a very delicate uh, uh, topic, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, to the extent that those differentials uh, reflect uh, different risk conditions and risk uh, in different fundamental conditions, it is, of course, uh, you know, in the action of the ECB, there is a, almost a quasi-fiscal element. Now, in, uh, in the Vox piece that uh, Isabel referred to, we show that uh, the Fed of monetary policy, uh, if you do not control for this uh, spreads phenomenon, which uh, uh, is concurrent to periods of, of, of stress, of stress, of risk, uh, you know, financial stress, then uh, actually, uh, you know, the, the usual nice shape of the, you know, of, of the effect of uh, interest rate policy, uh, you know, breaks down. Okay, so to get the, uh, you know, the, the usual, um, you know, uh, shape of, uh, of the impulse response actions, uh, you really need to control for the effect on sovereign spreads. Uh, so now if we look just at this descriptive uh, uh, the, uh, the fact, you know, what happened since March 2020, uh, we had both, uh, as the PEP was announced, we had both a significant drop in the yield curve and the sharp narrowing of the spreads, uh, which just as COVID uh, uh, became evident, uh, then those spreads are spiked. And uh, so while at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we had uh, a decoupling between sovereign yields and the risk-free rate, uh, after the policy intervention, they moved more or less together. Now, um, so this narrow end spreads, of course, uh, you know, part, of, uh, part of, the, uh, of the cause of it could also be the concomitant, the concomitant uh, fiscal action uh, at the federal level, which I refer uh, before. Uh, so this was, was another example of coordination between monetary and uh, fiscal policy. Okay, so this is what we learned, in my view, um, during COVID, and how we could, uh, you know, use these new innovative uh, instruments in such uh, in, in such situation. So now let me uh, get to today. What are the challenges today? Now, like Loretta, I will not uh, uh, give you my view about what the re real inflation risk. Uh, there is. Plenty of evidence also coming from ECB research uh, uh, that uh, the situation in Europe is slightly different uh, than uh, at the Fed, uh, mostly uh, because of the different uh, um, the different um, size of our fiscal packages. Okay, so in the, in the US, uh, the fiscal uh, the fiscal measures were much more. Uh, uh, were, were larger uh, and uh, you know so the so the uh, there is less evidence if, if you want in the in, in the in the EU that inflation is really demand driven this is not uh, room for complacency of course because we have seen in the last uh, in the last uh, uh, numbers that uh, you know inflation start being widespread and affecting uh, also to a certain extent although in less uh, uh, less so than the U.S. also uh, long-term inflation expectations. But, you know, I'm not going to um, comment on that, uh, uh, except that, uh, you know, uh, except that, you know, the, probably the, the widespread view is that in the euro area, we are really facing a supply side phenomenon rather than the demand side phenomenon. But uh, there is no, no reason, no, no doubt uh, that uh, the ECB sooner or, sooner or later will have to move. Uh, and the question uh, that I want to put on the table is that uh, once the ECB uh, decides to move, then the question is about the pace of tightening, but also about the sequence of the use of instruments. So let me uh, comment on the sequence. So for the sequence, the ECB has already communicated uh, uh, that uh, um, it will withdraw from asset purchases first uh, and then move to, uh, to interest rate as a second step. Um, so 
these issues about the sequence has, has also, uh, you know, some uh, effect on, on what is the likely pace that, uh, uh, that uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, they're likely to choose or that, uh, you know, that, that one has to choose. So given the fact that the deposit rate uh, in the euro area is, is negative, uh, and this is really, frankly, hard to justify in the current circumstances, uh, the danger is that um, the pace, because of the of the decided sequence, uh, that uh, the pace of withdrawing from asset purchases uh, will be excessively fast, and this will uh, have the consequence of reemergence uh, of significant sovereign spreads, which actually links with uh, my first uh, comments uh, in, uh, on the first point. So, uh, so the, in a way, the sequence uh, may condition the pace of the tightening. Uh, now, if those, is, I mean, some tensions in the sovereign, sovereign market are already evident, but, uh, you know, if they were to uh, increase, that could actually jeopardize the effectiveness uh, of interest rate policies. Uh, it would generate fragmentation of financial market, as we have uh, witnessed it before, and the impairment uh, of the transmission mechanism. Again, in that um, Vox column, uh, uh, you know, which is based on some empirical research I've done with a uh, few co-authors, so we're trying to quantify the, 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 you know, the effect of this uh, segmentation effect. So at the end, uh, um, I think there are two trade-offs which are relevant for the policy discussion today. One is this inflation financial stability one, which is the one which, which I just discussed. And uh, I think that the answer in my reason to, to deal with this trade-off uh, is, uh, uh, is that uh, while thinking about tight tightening, the ECB also has to consider a new special tool, PEP-like, to deal with, uh, um, with the first function of asset purchases, uh, the more the financial stability function of asset purchases that I was referring uh, above. I know that there is a discussion about that, but it would be... Uh, I mean, uh, I would be definitely, if I were on the side on the policy, if, uh, on the other side of, uh, of the table and from the policy side, would be an advocate for such an instrument. Now, the second uh, trade-off is the traditional output inflation trade-off, uh, which we have uh, um, facing a supply shocks, uh, which is probably larger than what the U.S. is facing, also because the fact of the war on Ukraine are much more material for us, given our dependence on the Russian gas. Um, and of course, uh, here, you know, this is a very, very difficult problem to solve, okay? But part of the solution has to come, again, for the coordination between monetary and fiscal policy, which was one of the lessons learned in phase one. Uh, after all, fiscal policy, uh, should be a more appropriate uh, uh, tool to uh, to deal with what is substantially and you know, effectively an energy uh, an energy tax, which is uh, what we are uh, facing today. And the second uh, uh, is uh, uh, the second point uh, is a little bit more subtle. Okay, so we are facing uh, uh, an output inflation trade off of uh, maybe of uh, like. Uh, uh, you know, textbook kind, okay, facing a supply energy shock. Um, so maybe then the calibration of the horizon uh, at which inflation must return to target uh, uh, must be thought, must be understood in relation to that. Okay, in a recent report on the ECB strategy with uh, several other economists, European economists, we have argued that um, policy instruments that achieve price stability can have cost or benefits in terms of secondary objective. Now, to the extent that there are costs, uh, and in this case, the cost would be this after the unemployment, uh, that justify longer horizon for price stability objective. To the extent in which there are benefits, that ju justify shorter horizon for price stability. So I think that this is, uh, um, you know, this is still at a very high level, okay, so that uh, it's difficult to put number into this, but I think that this idea uh, should be, um, uh, you know, analyzed further and integrated uh, in this new flexible inflation targeting framework that, uh, that the ACB has uh, since the strategy review. That would be the all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lucrezia, for uh, uh, giving such a comprehensive overview of uh, what we actually did in the uh, pandemic. And I uh, would actually agree to many, many, many of the things you said, not precisely everything, but many of the things. I mean, I think what this uh, this shows, uh, Loretta, is that 
our life here in the euro area is is even more complicated than than yours in the in the US. I think this is what we uh, learned uh, what we learned from uh, Lucrezia's presentation. Uh, so let me turn to our uh, final speaker, uh, who is uh, Refet Gurkanak. Uh, he is professor of economics at Bildkent University. And he's also director of the CEPR's Monetary Economics and Fluctuations Program. He worked actually in the Monetary Affairs Division of the Federal Reserve Board around the time that this conference and the network were established. He has written numerous fascinating papers in um, monetary and financial uh, economics, and he argued in previous work that the central bank should not be the residual claimant of all policy, which would make life too easy for other policymakers and too hard for central banks. And he also told me that he believes central bankers talk too much. So I better stop talking and give him the floor. We are looking forward <laughs> to your remarks. That's very kind, thank you. And I certainly did not mean you uh, personally, but it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Uh, and it's lovely to be in the minority in this panel as a male economist. Um, it's rare enough that I still take note. Now, I, I will, um, touch upon the topics that you mentioned, and that therefore is not going to be on specifically Turkey or the Euro area or, or the US, but some changes that have been taking place in central banking over the past few decades, and whether we want uh, the direction of the change to be in the uh, same way still. Now, it's, it's hard to imagine this today, but three decades ago, we were still talking about the central banking mystique. Um, especially in the US, we didn't know what policy the central bank has taken, let alone why the policymakers had chosen that. Um, and we've come a long way. Uh, and the question here, I think, is whether we've come too long away. In that, um, there are times when the desired direction of change is very clear. I think a great example today is inflation, right? You know, around the world, except in Japan, we want lower inflation. And to begin to lower inflation, we don't have to yet answer the question, you know, to what level, right? This is too high. Just move in the right direction, begin to lower inflation. But there's an optimal level. And with communication, I think we never asked that question. It was clear that we started from a point where central bankers were communicating too little. Let me say we. Um, I still consider myself a central banker before anything else. And we moved in the right direction. We were more open. People understood what we were doing. People understood why we were doing. People understood what the preferences are. And these are all great. Um, but at some point, it begins to be this incessant and all-encompassing central bank noise. And for economists, I think this is something surprising that we did not ask, at what cost is this happening? Because we're trying to think in terms of trade-offs, in terms of opportunity costs. And we treat communication essentially as something that comes as free. And therefore, the more of this we do, the better it is. It really isn't. It's costly both for the provider, the central bank, but also for the recipient. On the provider side, right, um, you know, Loretta's talk here didn't write itself. And the time she spent on this and the time the staff spent on this could have been spent on something else. Now, this was a great talk, and I was lucky to be here to listen to it. Right? Um, I have to tell you, I don't feel this way about every central banker talk. And even when I get something out of it, it's still the case that it's not always obvious whether the staff would have been better utilized in working on something else. But more importantly, from the perspective of the recipient, this continuous central bank communication actually has a rather low signal to noise, right? Because the world doesn't change that fast. And it turns into this endless policymaker meeting through the public that, you know, often it's very clear that I'm not the intended recipient of this. I think the great example of this was uh, Draghi's whatever it takes, right? You go out, you say this, and then you go to the meeting and say, you know, look, we have to do this now, right? For that once, fine, well done. But do I really want every central banker to take this as an incentive and try to shape expectations to be able to go to their policy meetings and say, well, they expect us to do this, so we better deliver. 
right? And do I want to be used for this purpose? This continuous central bank sound comes at the cost of me being able to process other news. I have only so much information absorption capacity. I can listen to only so much news. And when the central bank saturates all of the news, I actually get lost. That's not a service to me. And let me be very clear here. You know, when your child is screaming their lungs out and you tell them to be quiet and they say, you know, don't mind me, right? That's no answer. And in the same vein, I can't be told, well, don't listen to me. Look at somewhere else, right? If you're talking, I will be listening. Oftentimes, what the central banker is saying isn't something that novel, but every now and then it is, and when it is, it's really important for me that I don't miss it. So it's really important, and I would want the central bankers to internalize this cost to me, right? So that's an important part of it. Now, um, you know, not content with saturating the financial markets, central bankers have moved to corresponding with or communicating with the general public, and that's the latest fad. And it's empirically evident that you are able to do this. I don't think anybody asked the general public whether they wanted to be communicated with by the central bankers. And this is a tricky issue, right? Um, part of it really sounds narcissistic. Um, the general public didn't know who their central banker was. We communicated, now they know. Well, good, but who cares? You know, if you're doing your job right, um, they probably won't know who you are, and you should be proud of that. But more importantly, um, if you are educating your general public about basic economics, for example, you ought to ask any country that has a central bank also has a ministry of finance or some equivalent. Right? Is this my job to do this? Do I want to spend central banking resources for this purpose? Or if you're saying, no, no, it's not just the you know, students, people who are uh, touched by the Ministry of Education, but we have this technology that allows us to educate or uh, inform the population as a whole, the students, financial markets, you know, stay-at-home people, whatever, everyone. Right? Then my question becomes, if we have such a technology, if we are able to get to people and inform them about something, what is it that I want to inform them about? And central banking probably wouldn't make my top 50 list, right? You know, talk about climate change, talk about the right way about changing diapers, talk way about, you know, racial disparities or income disparities or equal pay for equal work, a zillion things. Before you get to, you know, how central banking efforts are transmitted to the real economy. So, I genuinely think that we are past the efficient point in central bank communication um, and have become too communicative to our and general social welfare detriment. And the second part of my comments, which is going to be much shorter, is going to be that this is not only on core central banking topics, that the central banks are communicating about anything and everything. And that in itself is a problem. This is the bit that uh, Isabel so kindly alluded to. This part of my um, comments draw upon uh, work that was published in the International Journal of Central Banking, a journal Loretta was an extremely able editor of for a while, although you weren't the editor who published that. Um, that's work with Troy Davig. And the point here is, I guess, Partly due to this communication, partly rightly, um, central bankers are seen as extremely competent public servants, which is true, um, which really is true. But, but it doesn't generalize to, you know, central bankers are able to do anything and therefore they should do everything. But central banks have began to pander to this line of argument by their behavior in the US by talking about racial disparities as a central banking issue in the euro area by talking about climate change and global warming as a central banking issue. The point here isn't that these are unimportant. They are terribly important. It's that they're not central banking. Now, governments in general are very happy when central banks talk about these things and extend their mandates to include these. Economists in general are, I'd say, doubtful to um, 
opposed. And oftentimes, when economists are opposed to this, to my taste, they are opposed for the wrong reason. It becomes a question of trade-offs, finally here, that, well, you know, central bank trying to attend to these other mandates come at the cost of their core mandate of inflation. Now, if this is the argument, I see no argument. If you're telling me that, you know, the ECB can actually seriously dent global warming, but it's going to come at the cost of inflation, you know, survival of human species, inflation, that doesn't seem like a difficult decision to make. Okay, then it becomes, well, no, you can't really do much by central banking about this. Okay, then we are talking about this, you know, quibbles about what exactly the right trade off is. To me, the bigger problem here is that we're still talking about the central bank as the policymaker who can and should do something about these very important topics. This naturally extends from the way we approach optimal policy questions, where the literature to this day, equates optimal policy with optimal monetary policy. That if something is going to be done, it's the central bank that's going to do it. For some questions, this was okay. But when it gets to things like, you know, house prices, asset price bubbles, global warming, income distribution, racial disparities, it really begins to be a straitjacket that is not appropriate to answer these important questions. Because if you ask, there is only the central bank. What should the central bank do? But if there is only the central bank, of course, the central bank should try to do something. But there isn't only the central bank. There are a whole host of policymakers. And whenever the central bank willingly takes on an extra mandate, the policymaker who could have done something about this essentially gets a free pass. And to me, that is the big cost of the central bank mandate creep. The issue here is that when the ECB is talking about climate change, policy, you know, politicians and other policymakers are very happy to say, yeah, the ECB should do more. But you know, think that you are a industrialist, whatever, um, electricity producer of the coal burning and the ugliest, dirtiest kind, right? Would you, you know, would you prefer this being a central banking issue or an environmental regulator issue or a fiscal policy issue? Right. I think the answer is very clear. I'd much rather have the central bank try to do something about it because they really can't. Right. And if it's the central bank trying to do something about it, it means that the environmental regulator is off my neck, which is what I really wanted. So here, I think the big issue is that in these really important points, if the central bank is going to say something, the right thing to say is to go out and say, these are really important. And this is the regulator who should do something about it. The ECB coming out and saying, we see global warming as a, you know, extremely important economic problem, not something we can do something about. We'll do our best, whatever it is, but it's not a central banking issue and point to whoever it is that can actually do something. This isn't a topic about, you know, minding your own business the right way. Make sure that in your institution, you know, incomes are, the right way, you're hiring in a diverse way, your building is heated through renewable sources, these are all fine, right? But it's a different thing to say, I am the policymaker for this purpose. And then looking at the world and saying, ah, it's a surprising that things aren't getting better. Well, because the policymakers who would make things better are no longer acting and they're happy to you know, watch you suffer. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Refit. Uh, so um, that, that these are, of course, fascinating thoughts. And maybe um, uh, I will ask a question to Lucrezia. So, um, so what would you say to Refit if he said that uh, that your proposal uh, on what the ECB uh, should do uh, would kind of take the pressure from governments? To actually complete the euro area architecture, so in the in the vein in the vein of of, of refit, what would you say to that? Well, in a way, uh, the ECB has already done uh, a lot of communication on that. I mean, starting with Draghi in uh, you know I would say from 2014. Okay, so that actually that was a Draghi speech uh, at Jackson Hole, I believe. 
in which he said quite explicitly that uh, monetary policy could not possibly work if fiscal policy was going in the opposite direction, so that form some form of coordination was necessary and that uh, more resharing uh, was needed uh, in the euro area. So, and I think uh, you have done your part, Isabel, as well. You know, so. <laughs> So I think that uh, that was, to me, a very useful function that uh, that uh, ECB policymakers had in the construction of the euro area, because, uh, you know, with the capital of credibility and independence, uh, they uh, advocated a certain direction of travel. Now, by saying that, of course, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, then, uh, uh, you know, I mean, these, you know, many different uh, possible institutional setups can follow in which you want you can make this like an active collaboration or a real coordination through committees or just you know some you know de facto or you know soft coordination which is basically what we have now but which is however very fragile okay because you know it's not uh, it is not written in, in in any form and in fact Actually, our treaties discourage any form of coordination because that, uh, in one interpretation of the treaty, that's it's against uh, would be against uh, uh, ECB independence. So, um, I mean that part. Okay. So, uh, uh, but then Refet said also lots of other things about what the ECB should not say that I don't agree with. But uh, okay. But my answer to your question is is what I just said. Yes, on fiscal policy, it's an example. Yeah, so uh, th uh, thank you very much. So uh, actually, I also would like to come back to a point that you made, uh, Lucrezia, in your introductory remarks, uh, which is, is certainly right. And I think the same was was true for the Fed, that, um, that our policies had a very important uh, market stabilizing uh, effects at the beginning of the pandemic. And I think there at that time, our I mean, I have, our policies were also incredibly effective, right? I always tell people, you know, if the ECB or the Fed or others had not ha uh, had not acted in that way, together, of course, with fiscal policy, I mean, we probably would have faced a big global financial crisis. And the the I mean, so uh, I, I think that's that's pretty clear. Uh, at the same time, when it comes to these uh, financial uh, stability issues, um, uh, of course, there's also, uh, always also a question of, I mean, are we giving rise to some type of uh, moral hazard? So the, the famous central bank put and so on. Uh, Loretta, do you, do you have a, a view on, on that? I mean, I, we have to be attuned to financial stability risks when we're doing monetary policy, and there needs to be more work on that. But I totally agree. I think people forget how uncertain the environment was at the beginning of the pandemic. And, you know, I've already phrased it. We wouldn't have wanted to have a financial crisis on top of a COVID crisis. That would have been a, a horrible situation. And people also forget how the, you know, the downside scenarios were very, very dire. I think the challenge is, okay, once you do that, when do you retreat from that? And I think that's the thing that in the U.S., you know, we've been criticized for, you know, perhaps we stayed too long. But, you know, Chris Waller gave a nice talk at Hoover about just running through sort of the thought processes on the committee about how do you how do you think about things in real time? And um, now, of course, we're committed to doing what we need to do with our tools to bring inflation down. So, again, <laughs> we have to think we have to think about financial stability. I guess the way I'm looking at it now is a lot of the things that was go were going on in the treasury market at the beginning of the pandemic really illuminated that there are real structural issues in that very, very important market, which is why there's a working group, the president's working group to actually address some of those real structural issues so that we don't have um, that situation. But you're going to have times when the central bank has to step in and add liquidity because of these flight to quality issues and you have to be ready to do that and then withdraw at the appropriate time. And I think that's the way I, I've been thinking about that. Yeah, uh, so, I mean, if we, if we look back into history, I think, um, I mean, all of the big financial crises took place in an, uh, you know, at a time when uh, interest rates were going up. So how, how worried should we be? 
that that this creates financial stability risks. I mean, it's actually also related, of course, to what Lucrezia said. Yeah, I mean, right now, I think we're withdrawing at a pace where the markets have been handling. Of course, there's volatility in the markets, but the trades are happening. The markets are functioning. You may not like the level of where equity prices are on any particular day, any particular minute, but the markets are functioning. But we certainly have to be aware of that. And especially as we reduce the balance sheet, you know, we're going to be wanting to gauge, you know, what effect is that having not only on um, financial market functioning, which I think will be fine. It'll be, you know, how much is that um, contributing to tightening of financial conditions? And again, we'll have to calibrate, you know, our policies to what's actually happening to getting inflation down towards our goal. And that's why, you know, we, we have this period now where we're still very under neutral, right? The plan is to get towards neutral um, relatively quickly. I think the words everyone's using is expeditiously, right? And then, right, assess conditions because both supply side factors and demand side factors are going to be changing over time. And that's the real challenge is to be able to assess that calibration and seeing how much more do we have to go? How much faster do we have to go? Or are, is inflation coming down faster than we thought so that we can actually um, maybe go at a slightly slower pace? But I think that's the real challenge is how do you do that calibration? Yes, in, in, indeed. So I, I don't see any raised hands at the moment. So as long, I mean, please feel free to ask a question or send a question to the chat. But if not, I'm, I'm going to ask another question to Refet actually. So I, I uh, I actually, uh, I mean, I understand your point on communication, and of course, uh, from time to time, we are also discussing that. There's this one point where I would probably not agree, which is on this question on communication to the general public, because, I mean, we have done very little of that in the past. And I mean, what uh, that has led to uh, in the in the uh, Euro area, and actually in particular in my home country, uh, Germany, is that you know, uh, that all kinds of narratives about monetary policy uh, have been built, which which has been so harmful uh, and it has really created uh, also distrust because, you know, um, there, there were stories being told which were simply not correct. And I think it's very important that we kind of also explain, I mean, how we see things, why we do things, that pe that we can kind of a bit fight the wrong narratives without, of course, um, uh, immuni uh, immunizing ourselves towards criticism. But but how would you see that, Robert? This is a tricky one. I think that's a very good argument um, to, to reach out to the general public. On the other hand, um, I guess it, it really um, turns into a question of, well, look, um, if your problem is, look, the general public doesn't trust us, let's say, right? And the pricing behavior is so way off that before we reach out to these people, we can't disinflate properly. I understand the argument there. But in an environment where the outcomes are to your liking, but the people don't like you, right? Um, I, I, it's not very clear to me why it's so important for central bankers to be liked or um, you know, understood correctly. As long as you're getting your way in terms of you know, employment is high, inflation is low, growth is well, right? But people don't understand that, you know, we are the public servants who are doing this in good faith through these mechanisms. Um, okay, you know, let them be, right? Then I think my issue of don't mess with people, if you're going to reach out to them, reach out to them about something that is actually important. At that point, central banking isn't the important thing if you're getting your way, right? So I will agree with you in the Turkish context, for example, the problem here, of course, is our central bank isn't worthy of trust, so they can't do this. But um, you didn't say decided. Um, but you know, if and when the central bank changes and they are actually trying to do the right thing, right, getting that trust is going to be a big deal, and they will have to. We will have to reach out to the general public. Then I understand the argument, right? But not for its own sake. Can I add something about? the U.S. perspective, at least my own perspective about this, is we're not elected officials, right? So I think that it's very important for policymakers to explain what they're doing and why they're doing it, 
and you know talking to multiple audiences is probably a good thing i mean i i take your point as you know sometimes there's you know too many people out talking and maybe it's creating more confusion as opposed you know but what is it like better is not more is not necessarily better better is better and so it, you can create some problems when you have you know confusion but in general i think we have a responsibility as unelected you know people making policy to explain what we're seeing in the economy, what the rationale for our decisions are. Um, and I think we owe that to them. And owning, you know, if we've made mistakes, owning kind of, okay, we view it differently now, here's why, and trying to explain how, the process that we're going through. Yeah, I guess this, uh, I mean, accountability is actually, is, I, I would also agree, is, is quite important. So I have two questions. I mean, we are already over time. I'm sorry. Uh, Michael, um, for not being as disciplined as we should be, but it's so interesting that I would like to uh, to uh, kind of uh, uh, read one question and uh, hear another one, and then we we finish. I hope that's that's uh, that's fine. So uh, let me uh, start by reading uh, the question, uh, uh, which is co uh, coming from uh, Ruben Silva Branco. Uh, could a new financial stability-driven purchase program, as alluded to by Lucrezia, be a useful instrument to cope with the potential financial stability challenges posed by, uh, by the um, removal of ECB's accommodation, which we are discussing? In other words, could that new instrument provide degrees of freedom in withdrawing APP purchases and rising policy rates? So I guess it's very much in line with what Lucrezia had in mind, but I don't know who wants to uh, say a few words on this. Well, I would say that this is exactly what I was trying to, to say, so I would... Um... Yes, thank, uh, uh, thank you. So let me give... So I don't know, Alessandro took his, his hand down, but do you still want to ask your question? We would be delighted if you, if you did. Yes, in the interest of time, I was... Uh, was uh, but my question uh, is for Loretta on the labor force participation rate. So it came down, is on a downward trend since the global crisis. Uh, uh, it did not recover even after several years, then it got knocked down again after COVID. We see some sharp rebound. So causes and consequences of what's happening now uh, uh, on the labor participation rate that in my, in my thinking is very important to understand the labor market and the supply side of the inflation pictures and so on and so forth. I mean, the long run trend in the US because of demographics is, is that labor force participation will trend down. Of course, before the um, you know, COVID um, hit, it was, you know, moving above trend again. So the, estimating what that trend is, is difficult. And right now it's below where it was pre pandemic. So a lot of people are trying to assess, you know, is it because more people retired, although now it seems like some of the older retirees are coming back. Maybe that's related to inflation rates, whether that's the same or not or not. Some people want to come in back into the market. Higher wages seem to be drawing more people into the, into the labor market, which is probably a good thing. But will that be sustainable if we can moderate some of that rise in, in wages? So again, I think there's a lot of work going on. You know, early in the pandemic, it was very clear that it was about health worries about health, child care, because, you know, a lot of the um, places where the contact, you know, was were a lot of women with ch children working in those um, restaurants per, you know, the service sector. So again, I think we're not going to know exactly until after. There are some scenarios in which participation, you can imagine, will be higher because remote work is now going to be easier. So you can have drawing more people in the labor market than you might have before. And there's going to be more maybe part-time workers as opposed to full-time workers. So I think in the near term, a lot of these things aren't that instructive for where policy needs to go to right now. But I, I do believe you're right in terms of figuring out what's that trend going to look like and what is it going to be in terms of thinking about long run, where's the stable, you know, um, where's neutral. All those, can, all those things are very important, I think not now necessarily in this moment but looking out a couple of years where will things settle down thank you 
Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Loretta. So I think now we really have to come to an end. I guess we have to, to meet again to discuss all the open questions. And there are many things that all of us, I think, would like uh, to, to say. But this has been such a fascinating panel. So thank, uh, thanks so much to our three fantastic panelists, of course, also to those who were uh, listening uh, to us and asking uh, uh, questions. Um, we also will have to close the uh, conference here, so I would like to express my thanks to all the speakers, to the great discussants, to our uh, fantastic conference organizers, uh, Barbara Rossi, Matteo Jacoviello, Anuka Renestiemi, and Michael Ehrmann. And last but not least, to Carol Suleiman, who has provided the administrative support for the conference and who, of course, deserves all the praise that the conference ran so smoothly. So hopefully by the uh, time of the next edition of this conference in two years time, we will have returned to a more normal regime where monetary policy has gone back to being boring. And you all can contribute to this. I very much look forward uh, to continue discussions with uh, many of you. So thank you so much for joining. Sorry for uh, for being a bit uh, too long and have a wonderful weekend. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you all.